to kind of go through introductions pretty quickly. Uh, as RJ mentioned, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, topic of collaboration, uh, which is a pretty, very, pretty big topic. Um, so we're going to start out with a little bit of context and background about what we're going to be talking about. And that's going to be kind of me talking a little bit solo while my name's uh, sitting comfortably here. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what it's been like uh, for us to design together, some of the results of uh, the project, and uh, what we learned along the way. Um, so, RJ already kind of talked a little bit about my background, but uh, my career started back in advertising, uh, doing some retouching of uh, images of pancakes for a very well-known international pancake company. Um, <laughs> and along the way, I eventually got in, uh, interested in designing software, uh, working with new technology, and really kind of uh, taking advantage of the ability to control the interfaces that people uh, uh, get to play with. Um, some of the work that I get to do now involves leading a team of designers uh, to design interfaces for mobile uh, devices, but also connected devices like smart thermostats, wearables, things like that. Um, there was a lot of I wanted to say uh, regarding the background, but starting with the phrase that all started back in 1995 didn't seem to uh, work for an hour. So I simplified it. There's just a few things that you're going to need to understand as we move into some of the details about the project. Uh, just like you know what you're good at and uh, what you're not good at, we know as well at TAC we're great at uh, building software and designing interfaces. We also know that the process of creating something uh, is not linear and it's not pretty. Um, I think a lot of times um, the process of creating something is described as kind of a line with steps along the way, but I feel like this is a bit more accurate, um, especially when you're getting other people uh, involved. Um, the great thing about this uh, design squiggle, as it's called on the internet, um, is that it's pretty versatile too, so I can use this to describe my day, my week, or even my lunch, you know? Uh, so uh, as we were going more and more through the, the project or this, um, this presentation, uh, Meg and I uh, continually re started referring back to the squiggle to the point where Meg came up with this hand gesture to represent it, so uh, I can say, hey Megan, how was your lunch? And she can go, like that. <laughs> So, um, we're, we started getting uh, used to using it quite a bit. The one thing that it didn't account for was kind of this nice slope to line at the beginning of this uh, crazy squiggle, uh, which is usually where you have a great idea, um, you're uh, unrestrained, there's no budgets, there's no timelines, and this is a really important part of the process because um, it gets you excited about what you're going to do, and you can be a little bit naive with what it's going to take to build something. Um, so we're going to be referring back to this group quite a bit when we're talking about um, this project. Um, as much as it can be accurate, um, it also represents a certain level of comfort. Uh, you know, when we're designing software, uh, we know that we're going to be dealing with certain variables like we're going to have a designer, we're going to have a developer, we're going to have somebody who's running the budget. Um, so we're able to work within those constraints, feel comfortable, and that allows us to um, adjust for any kind of deviations that might pop up along. But what happens when those variables change? Good question. We have the opportunity to find out. So we were kind of in a position about a year and a half ago where we needed to move offices. Um, and so we started gathering feedback about what this new office space should look like. So this is an image of the first space that we were in when we originally started TAC. And one bit of feedback that we received from a lot of people is how much they love the collaborative atmosphere within Battery 61, which is over on 60 Cal now. Um, what they loved about it is that there were a lot of companies in the space, and um, as much as they felt like they could go away to their own space, they also loved that there was um, a disability for a lot of these companies to kind of clash over lunch or just kind of hanging out at different events. So we uh, made it a little bit naive and asked, you know, how could we create um, this environment? You know, was there an opportunity to uh, bring that same type of feeling into our own space? So we kind of had a somewhat scary idea um, where we thought, hey, rather than kind of seek out a space that might afford us this type of environment, what if we just built the environment ourselves? What if we created a shared workspace adjacent to our own office? And before we kind of set out um, on a path of really figuring out what it would take to do this, we had to ask, does something just like this really need to exist? Um, there's a lot of really great examples of other shared workspaces here in Denver. I encourage you all to go check it out, just to change up your environment, get to know the people that are working in those spaces. 
Um, and it's been a really great trend. A lot of this uh, attack of trying to work with other uh, shared workspaces. Whenever I go back to my hometown in California, uh, I try to find a shared workspace to work on. And as we all know, the space is important. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we got the space right as we were designing and thinking about a uh, place that people were going to be spending their days and trying to attack that squiggle that they have to deal with on a daily uh, basis. So, I'm almost done here, I'm just going to jump in. Um, we're, uh, so, in order to kind of encapsulate what it was that we needed to do for this space, we kind of set some goals for ourselves. Um, we wanted to make sure that the space, space felt professional, we wanted to make sure it was a space that people could take pride in when we were bringing other coworkers in or other clients. Um, we wanted to do something that they could identify with, and most importantly, we wanted to remove friction, which means kind of going back to this squiggle that I started back um, at the beginning of this presentation. You know, was there a way that we could smooth this out for people? There's so many things they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we had some ideas around how we could really make uh, people's uh, uh, work, uh, work day uh, much easier to, to get through. And if there, if it was much easier to um, get your work done and do great work, we thought that um, that would enhance the work that we did over at TAC as well. Um, so much to the point that um, maybe some of this would start trickling out into the community. Um, you know, maybe there were some companies that would start with two desks, grow, and eventually go find another office space uh, somewhere else. So those were a lot of the things that we were thinking about as we were getting into this project. So we were super excited and a little bit scared, um, but we didn't really know where to start. So the first thing that we did is we took a tour of the space. So this is actually this fourth floor. Uh, assembly attack is right down the hallway. And this is what it looked like uh, the first time we went to go check it out. Um, it was pretty windy that day. I felt like I was going to blow off the side of the building um, or trip on one of these uh, uh, metal forms. But um, it was hard to really imagine how this would turn into a space that people would really call um, their, their workspace on a day-to-day -day basis. We also started out with some early floor plans to kind of get a better idea of what the space might look like as it came together. Um, and it's about 4,000 square feet, so it's smaller than a lot of other uh, shared workspaces out there. Um, but it's great because it's a really intimate environment, and because of the small number of people, uh, I feel like there's a, a great community that's been um, evolving inside of it. We also researched other spaces. So whether it was visiting different companies that we thought um, had great spaces, or um, you know, other shared workspaces, uh, for browsing the internet. Uh, we found a lot of great images and took images of what we liked about these spaces. And there's a pretty consistent theme here in that um, a lot of the spaces were very open and they had all these little uh, flexible pockets of space that people could get together really quickly and collaborate. We also spent a lot of time thinking about the, the brand and identity of the space, uh, particularly because we didn't want it to overwhelm the other companies that were going to be in the space. We wanted it to be uh, more, play more of a supporting role, but give people uh, a sense of identity when they walk in the space as well. But at that point, we had pretty much reached our limit. Um, we were spending a lot of time and energy and resources in designing out the space, and we knew we didn't want to kind of dabble around with the idea of interior design or space design. Um, so that's when we seek some more help. Uh, and we're making it. Coming into the picture. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Megan. I'm the principal designer at Swiss Milk Studio. Um, so my background is not exactly linear. I started studying film in Boulder. My first job I was involved was finance in San Francisco. Eventually, I moved to Chicago to start studying interior design. And after a miserably cold winter in Chicago, I moved back here to Denver, which is my hometown. Um, practicing to design in our fair city ever since. Um, so as Tom mentioned, when I did the project, TAC had already done a considerable amount of thinking surrounding how simply it was going to look and how it was going to feel. Um, so our collaboration was really going to be about how do we take these concepts that they'd already established and apply them to build a physical environment. Um, so to answer that, we had to ask more questions. The first of which surrounded density. We needed to know how many people were going to go in the space 
and where were they going to go? Um, so to figure that out, we analyzed a series of SketchUp models. Um, this model here represents the space at maximum capacity. So this is uh, 32 desks, the most desks that can fit in 4,000 square foot space while still adhering to certain codes. Um, with this, it was pretty easy for us to see that this wasn't going to work. It was too crammed. It really wasn't going to facilitate a productive environment. So fast forward a few meetings, and we ended up with this. This is half of that capacity. It's 16 desks, a handful of small offices, a conference room, a shared break space. And then as one mentioned, there's kind of a variety of flexible, casual spaces that we picked up with some examples we looked at. At this point, the theory was that this amount of capacity would create a spacious atmosphere that we hope would actually give the tenants a sense of ownership that you don't have to find in collaborative working space. Beyond that, we had to ask some aesthetic questions, a couple surrounding furniture and finishes. We wanted the space to kind of disappear. We didn't want it to be distracting to the tenants. So we landed on a neutral color palette, so natural finishes. Um, that said, we didn't want it to be boring, so we incorporated some bright color and some fun pattern into the mix. Beyond the aesthetic, we had to think about function. Um, a few quick examples there of lighting and ergonomics. On the lighting end, we did a kind of a variety of lighting sources. We have pendant lighting, we have track lighting. Um, and what this does is it creates kind of a layered lighting environment that creates a warm atmosphere. On the ergonomic side, we tested many chairs. We landed on this beautiful Satu Carmenola chair. Um, and we did all of this because you know, we wanted the space to be really comfortable and inviting for people. Um, the decisions we made were not landed on after just one meeting. We went through many, many iterations of things. So what you see here is one of the original concepts of the reception area. So when all of you mosey down the hall after this, what you'll see is that what's existing today excuse me, doesn't actually look like this. So some of the materials are similar, but by and large, most of the elements have changed. Um, one of the original concepts that went through several iterations that I think actually end up being one of the most successful elements in the space are these wooden ceiling that you see here. Um, the, sorry, I hate public speaking. It's terrifying to me. I'm just going to say it and I'll feel better. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, the image in the center here represents a uh, ceiling plant, which is where all of these ceiling beams live. Um, I think this is one of the most successful features of the space because these beams are a really great example of design efficiency. They do like five different jobs in one element. Um, they serve as a guide for the lighting, which you can see some of the track that goes. Uh, they helped us deal with acoustics. They helped us define uh, where we put the clusters of desks. Um, and we very intentionally put them underneath the beams because they help deal with acoustics. And on top of that, they create a really warm, rustic uh, finish in a space that is industrial and largely unfinished. So we knew it was important to get things right. In a lot of cases, I think we were guilty of spending uh, one of the things that we really spent a lot of time on was the phone room. Um, you know, this is a pretty uh, familiar concept in, uh, you know, for different companies have spaces and different shared workspaces. The reason we spent so much time on these is because when we were looking at other phone booths, phone booths and some of those spaces, there's always kind of something that popped out. Either it was too hot in there, there weren't any plugs, there wasn't a place to sit, or there wasn't somewhere to put my laptop when I was trying to have a phone call. Um, so those were a lot of the things that we kind of labored over, kind of standing at this empty shell of them, that was kind of thinking about, you know, well, what if I need to bring somebody in and I want to do whiteboarding? Or what if I need to uh, take a call, put my laptop down, and sit so I can take notes? Um, and what happened is we actually gave up one of our closed offices to create a bit more of a hybrid phone booth that kind of works as uh, a main conference room, and it's been one of the uh, most used areas in the space. Uh, from some of the analysis that I've done before, we also knew we needed a central hub. We needed a 
reception desk, but we knew we needed it to be something bigger than just a place where visitors were greeted. Um, and because we did so much thinking about this, now it serves as a place where UPS guys and our packages, um, you know, if you need a pair of scissors, you can get a pair of scissors there, if you need to scan something, if you need to grab something, um, you can really get it there. So it kind of functions as like a command center. Um, and this ended up being an important element because if you're working with kind of a dedicated desk capacity, um, you probably don't think about bringing a pair of scissors with you to work each day. Um, so it really, again, on the note of removing friction, um, this is something that we feel like is really successful there. The other thing was poker chips. So um, one thing that we kind of observed a lot was kind of the friction between um, you know, whether or not we want to provide food for people for free or charge them. And we kind of ended up in kind of a happy medium where uh, they were able to buy things, but not with money, we had our own currency. Um, so people were able to exchange uh, money for these poker chips, um, and then they used these uh, based on an honor system to buy snacks uh, within the break room. Um, this means that people don't need to worry about kind of leaving cash around in drawers or other things like that. This is only something that works in assembly, uh, and so far uh, it's worked out really well. Plants. Plants everywhere. Um, this isn't something that we actually thought a lot about, we just maybe over it. Um, <laughs> at one point I was told we were not allowed to order any more planters, and so I found this stuff. Um, but what we found is that adding this um, live element into, again, the industrial space really made the space feel a lot softer. It made it feel a lot more comfortable throughout the working day. Uh, in some cases, leading up to you when we started uh, working on the space, I think we got a little bit ambitious with some of our ideas. Uh, one thing that we thought about doing was having um, uh, resources available in the space that um, there might have need to have access to like a lawyer, a CPA, a notary, things like that. Um, the reason being is that we wanted to make sure that again, kind of thinking of that squiggle and removing friction, we don't want people to have to leave and kind of go drive, you know, 30 minutes to go meet with somebody. We thought we could bring some of those resources into the space that would kind of help people out a lot. Uh, but we don't have a lawyer and we don't have a CPA. Uh, but we do have uh, a notary who also uh, doubled as our community manager in the space, which means um, people can just get something notarized. They don't have to drive somewhere, find out the, the notaries on lunch, or they only work there Tuesdays and Thursdays. As long as our community manager is at her desk, she can notarize something. Um, so the intent of thinking through all these things was to carry through the space, and really, even though we were spending a ton of time on these things, um, we wanted to have a lot of these details disappear, which is kind of a similar goal to how we think about um, designing interfaces. You know, you really just want the uh, interface to disappear and allow people to achieve their goals, get through their tasks really quickly. But it was really hard to know what to expect. Um, you know, if we're paying for desks, building furniture, filling out the space, you know, it's hard to know what it's really going to be like when people um, started working there. Um, there wasn't really any good way for us to test our design. Um, we could look at 3D models all day, uh, we could drop in silhouettes, we could walk through SketchUp, but it didn't really give you a sense of how the space would evolve over time. Which is a pretty drastic difference from, again, what I'm used to in software, because I can create a prototype, put it in front of people, get feedback, and continue to iterate. The cool thing was that as soon as we opened the doors, people were really great about getting feedback. Um, you know, it made a lot of the Late night talks, uh, a lot of the money that we spent on the space really worthwhile. Um, you know, so some of the things we brought up about plants and spaciousness and the way that we thought about things uh, actually um, were things that people found. One of those people giving feedback was me. I actually became a tenant of the space for a brief window of time. Um, and it was really cool to have been a part of the design process. Um, when I moved in, it was just me and a couple other tenants, and by the time I moved out, the space was full. So it was cool to see how it changed, and it really did evolve with the people in there. We saw people using the phone booth in different ways, even though we spent a lot of time thinking about the phone booth, they were still using it in different ways. Um, so it really does continue to change as tenants 
come and go. One of the things that we thought about that um, we didn't necessarily know was going to be a really big deal was having a dedicated community manager in the space. Um, this person has essentially become the hub and the face of the space and uh, really works hard to build relationships with the tenants in the space, understand their needs, kind of balance that with other people that are coming into the space, um, things like that. And it's been really important to have that person play a role. Uh, as Mike talked about earlier, in interior design, one of the biggest challenges is that you really cannot test the theory. Um, you can get it to 90% and then sad but true, you just gotta go like that and hope that it works. Um, so that's something to always ways to improve. Something that we did in the initial stages is that we really thought about this design in terms of flexibility. Um, and now we're seeing that we actually do need more than one conference room. And because we thought about this flexibility in the beginning, um, we actually have a space where we can put up a wall into a door and then voila, we have additional content. Uh, another big thing that we wanted to make sure we focused on was the flexibility of the space. So, as I mentioned earlier, some people might come in, get a single desk, and their company might grow to three, five, ten people. Um, so, having that open kind of flex space really allowed us to um, provide a, an atmosphere where people can take ownership of their space and really help it grow in the way that they need to. So, here's that swivel again. Um, uh, again, our eyes are dead set on trying to smooth this out. Uh, in many ways, I feel like we did achieve some of those goals. Um, there's always opportunities for improvement, which we're actually really excited about. And if anything, it's really great to see a lot of the interactions that are occurring inside of the shared space, um, whether it's between people in assembly, between people at assembly and tech. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that we were reflecting on as we were um, putting this presentation together was how much those interactions actually changed uh, Megan and myself and our perspective around what collaboration can actually make. One of those things which I think is uh, pretty clear is that anything that you do, um, especially with other people, is going to end up being different than how you originally imagined it. Um, I think along the way, we kind of just fully embraced this. And as Megan pointed out, we just kind of cross your fingers and uh, kind of see how things turn out. Um, but all along the way, uh, again, reflecting back, we really kind of talked about the things that were really important when we were kind of doing this back and forth and, and working on the space with other people. You know, it was important to be humble, trust and listen to people, um, and also um, just be uh, open to new ideas. So uh, a big part of that was really kind of giving up control. Um, and an example is actually uh, Megan delivered kind of one of the first rounds of floor plans to me, and I did kind of a big designer no-no, and I said, hey, that's a great floor plan. Let me open it up in Illustrator, and I'll see it a little bit. And I said, yeah. So I felt really bad about that, but it was an effort to uh, kind of move the creative process forward. Um, and Megan was a really good sport. I don't think she has to me too much, but... Uh, I don't think he actually felt really bad about it, either. <laughs> um, you know, in, in terms of stepping out of my comfort zone in our collaboration, um, most of my clients do not have the skill set to take an AutoCAD file and put it into Illustrator and change it. <laughs> Um, but something that I really learned from it is that when you are able to step back and, and listen in a different way, this did actually kind of help us cut through a lot of red tape in terms of getting to where we wanted to go faster. It was just the kind of communication that I had never been presented with before. Uh, <laughs> so another big thing for me, uh, since I'm the creative director over at Tech Mobile, I'm really used to being um, highly involved with a lot of the, the work that we do. Um, in the case of assembly, it got to a point where I just had to really step back. Uh, I felt like I was getting more in the way than I was really helping. Um, and that's uh, a big area where I think for me trust was super important and uh, again, just allowing people to do their best work without me kind of pointing things out and just kind of letting them take control. It was true. It was so great not to have to deal with it. <laughs> Um, he's, not, he's amazing, and uh, but you know when you when you do want to listen in terms of in collaborative areas, 
there's always going to be a moment when there's just simply too many books in the kitchen, and you need to extract some people. Um, and this happens, I think, in a successful collaboration when there's enough trust established in that relationship where people do feel like they can step back. Um, and then you can divide and conquer and execute the way that you need to. I think one of the big things uh, going through that process that's really happened is um, we really feel comfortable about what we're working with now, and it's allowed us to feel um, really confident in moving on to other ideas. So, you know, with assembly, now that it's kind of finished, we have people in there, and we talk about, hey, what if we, you know, take assembly to other cities? Um, we've had other, uh, other companies contact us uh, to uh, do consulting around bringing a shared workspace as a part of their company, um, things like that. So we're really excited about where we can go. And I think the biggest thing, kind of reflecting back on this entire journey, was just how much collaboration is more than just something like a word, how important the environment should be considered, uh, and just the general space, uh, whether it's the mental space or the emotional, the emotional space. Um, you know, you really need to put yourself in a position to look at collaboration from the right perspective.